I'm uh, Tony George, and I'm medical director of the Complex Mental Illness Program and chief of the uh, Schizophrenia Division at CAMH. That I think there, there are multiple problems uh, in our training, uh, both in medical school and in residency. I think that um, addressing addictions is not considered a priority, and yet the irony is is that you know the majority of our patients have addictive disorders, and I think what happens over time is there's a vicious cycle where psychiatrists um, get in a position where they become less and less comfortable about it. They've, they've been told that this is not something that psychiatrists typically um, need to develop expertise in and it becomes a vicious cycle and yet they see patients almost every day that are being affected by addictions. Um, so I think it's primarily a knowledge problem. I think it, it's also sort of a, a role diffusion. Um, psychiatrists in trying to provide integrated care ironically don't integrate addictions well into their daily practice. And, you know, it, it, it makes sense that they would because the disorders that they treat, you know, in terms of the underlying biology that goes wrong, the pharmacology, and even using psychotherapeutic techniques, all, you know, the principles that we use to, to address, identify, diagnose, and treat addictions fall very nicely within our frameworks, as exemplified by the DSM, DSM-5, in its latest iteration, and yet this is something that's not given much time in residency curriculums. It's five years, and we have a total combined time of about two months that we devote to addictions. I think I got into this whole field when I was actually a resident, second year resident, and I wanted to work on a general inpatient unit we had a choice of subspecialty and, and, uh, and general units. And I thought, you know, for my training, I've got to get the broadest exposure. And I have a chance to be on a unit that deals with people with serious mental illness, like schizophrenia, mood disorders, like bipolar disorder. That was really my interest. And what I realized was that just about every one of those patients that was going to come to this academic unit had an addiction problem. And whether it was the main problem or a more secondary problem, Frankly, if it wasn't considered the main problem, once we did a little digging, it turned out that it was probably the reason that they came in the first place. They relapsed to their cocaine use, their alcohol use, um, and that's what brought them into the hospital in their acute presentation. Um, I think more recently what has struck me, in, and, I, and that was, I trained, very, very fortunately I trained on a unit that was addiction oriented. So it was actually a concurrent disorders or dual diagnosis unit. That's what the name of it was, which is concurrent, concurrent disorders here in Canada. And most recently working with some of our units in the old schizophrenia program, now complex mental illness program, um, I will often get called to see very difficult patients clinically, administratively for an opinion. And I would say of the 15 or 20 times that I've done this, there's been an undiagnosed addiction problem you know, from something as simple as, you know, when they go out onto our grounds, they meet up with someone who gives them drugs or cigarettes. And, you know, so it could be undiagnosed nicotine withdrawal or craving that leads to aggression or cocaine or alcohol. Um, most recently, I've, you know, dealt with some behavioral addictions that, you know, maybe masqueraded as, as psychotic disorders or mood disorders. So it's very interesting because the, the kinds of presentations we see on acute psychiatric units in acute outpatient settings are off, almost uniformly influenced by some kind of substance or other behavioral um, addiction. So I think that's what keeps it relevant to me. As you know, my, my area of interest is tobacco and now uh, other smoke behaviors like cannabis. And it's just striking the kind of impact these have on on day-to-day -day functioning, on on other areas like cognition and clinical symptoms. And so I think my lesson, and you know, this is my bias, is that addictions are, you know, a very important part of dealing with psychiatric patients. And, you know, that's why I've come to the conclusion that um, this is something that's very relevant to our day-to-day -day practice.
In terms of an approach to patients here at CAMH with concurrent disorders, I think you know most of the of the ball game is really identification, right? So um, we have taken the approach in the complex mental illness program that we want to offer consultation, uh, but really what it is is a capacity building exercise to have the inpatient and outpatient teams develop core competencies in assessing and making decisions about that and if they can't handle it, bringing it to our, our specialists, our subspecialists and to myself and, and the way we've really tried to train, to, to take this to be a meaningful experience is, inv is to involve our, our senior residents, our PG4 residents when they're doing chronic care and you know have them do consultations which is part of the UT psychiatry training rotation in addictive disorders and what it what what really they do is work with the interprofessional team with a psychologist who's who's well versed in concurrent disorders to sort of you know lead the consultation service and then work with the attending physicians with the staff to go present their findings to the team for discussion and then do a, the second phase is do a follow-up of people whether it's on the inpatient unit or if they get discharged so in in doing so that you know the majority of people we see are typically people with acute psychosis who have histories of substance use disorders and I would say the the main ones are cannabis and alcohol and you know where we you know have clearly defined behavioral treatments maybe less so in this population, pharmacotherapies to apply, but it, you know, we, we are of the belief that something in the underlying biology or presentation of the illness, the psychiatric illness, is a vulnerability factor to, you know, the initiation and maintenance of addictive behaviors. So by treating the patient optimally, by treating the underlying psychiatric illness optimally, by providing behavioral support appropriate pharmacologic therapies and support, we can take a, an integrated approach to helping, you know, get these people into recovery. And we talk about a dual recovery model for people with concurrent disorders, say concurrent mood disorder, concurrent schizophrenia with an addictive disorder. We talk about having, creating competencies among staff where they can treat both disorders simultaneously and in the same place. We, we don't believe in fragmented care that, you know, if someone with schizophrenia had an addiction that you'd send them for the addiction treatment first and then when that's under control, have them, you know, practically that's not possible, you know, or, or even, you know, the sequential approach of stabilize the psychosis and then send them for addiction treatment. So we believe that the same providers who provide acute and ongoing care for people with psychotic disorders ought to be able to do the addictions at the same time because frankly it's a manifestation of the underlying psychiatric illness so if we can't take a holistic approach it's like saying okay we just put this patient on an antipsychotic that has now caused weight gain and diabetes and but we're going to send you to an internist or you know a diabetologist to treat that right most psychiatrists should have the ability to at least diagnose that and do some preliminary management and you know which which goes back to some of the other questions is that we, we if we if we don't pursue an integrative model to treating these multiple concurrent disorders, whether it's concurrent addictions or medical problems with the psychiatric presenting illness, then we do a real disservice to the people we try to treat. So the advice I'd give to to any physician, whether at you know the training level as a resident or fellow or for you know our our staff psychiatrists, attending physician colleagues, is, um, you know, you're not going to get away from this. You're going to see it no matter what kind of practice you have. In fact, you know, so if you're at a place like CAMH, inpatient, outpatient, which tends to have more complex people, you're just going to have to expect it. But even if you're in the community, you know, you should, the norm should be, you know, you should be prepared to see it. You will see it. And you need to know at least how to identify it and how to refer it out. But the more you can do yourself to address it, and you know, I think this is where you know, we um, will get a lot of mileage if we can get some competencies around pharmacotherapies to our physicians, our psychiatrists here at CAMH and, and, and um, in our training programs make this you know, sort of a, a virtual requirement of their experiences, 
I think we'll, we'll do very well. I think the other thing that's striking to me is that many of our residents and our, our staff psychiatrists don't really know how to engage a patient into a discussion about uh, their addiction or suspected addictions and how to use classic motivational interviewing techniques to hook people into considering, you know, identifying their problem, acknowledging it, and then doing something about it. I think that's an area that, you know, in residency, there's there's a lot more that's been being done about that in the, you know, five or seven years since I've come here. Um, but we can do a lot more because, frankly, I see a lot of the senior residents who aren't good at engaging um, their their clients. And I think that's a problem because many of them, of course, are interested in doing psychotherapies, particularly, you know, the more high-ended nuanced therapies, CBT, DBT, IPT, interpersonal therapy. But you can't do that until you know how to engage your patients, right? So, I mean, I think, and I'm not sure if, if, we're, we're, if we're failing at the level of medical students or in early parts of residency, but I know that this is a continuing problem because I even see this among the staff psychiatrists that, we have in our program now we're not an addictions program in the complex mental illness program but you know frankly if 80 percent of the people are going to have histories of addiction and virtually 100 percent of them are, are tobacco smokers we have to find a way to do this and you know it, as you know the CAMH is moving towards a tobacco free environment and policy and so it's the, the intent is not to force people to quit smoking or address you know, other substances, but it's to raise awareness and create a healthy environment. So our psychiatrists need to uh, be really mobilized and empowered to be able to do this and work with our, with the other staff and interprofessional teams to make this happen. So um, my advice is there's lots of opportunities at a place like CAMH at whatever level you are, even if you're a senior physician at this organization and you want to learn about this, there is the knowledge and there are the resources to do so. Um, so it's not too late, you know, just like we tell our patients, it's not too late to quit alcohol, quit smoking, you know, it's not, never too late to learn these skills because these are, these really should be basic skills in the armamentarium of every physician. Uh, so that's my advice. Just learn it, use it, right? And there's, there are plenty of opportunities to do so. And we just, I guess we just have to find a way to empower people to, to realize that this is important. And, uh, and no matter what you do, a child psychiatrist, geriatric psychiatrist, general psychiatrist, you've got to be comfortable with dealing with addictions.